Hey everybody, it's Jeff Bergman with SATSuccessSecrets.com. Today what I want to talk to you about is how to use the main idea of a reading passage to answer all of the passage-based reading questions for the SAT critical reading. Since you've been reading my blog, you know that the biggest thing you can do to improve your critical reading score is to focus on the main idea of the passage. If you can really get that concept and apply it when you're taking the SAT, your score on the critical reading session will increase dramatically. And here's why. If you're having trouble with the reading passages, you're probably getting stuck in the details and missing the main idea of the passage. Sometimes when you read a passage, you might get confused by certain words or certain sentences or even by whole paragraphs. And you might be tempted to read and reread those parts until you understand exactly what they mean. But I recommend that you don't do it. It's a big waste of your valuable time. And here's why. When you're reading the passage, most of what's confusing you is the details. But not all of the details will be referred to in the questions. And if they don't ask you about those details, you don't have to know them. That's why it's important that you don't get caught up in the details when you read. Now you're asking yourself, I'm sure, which details do you have to know? And the SAT will tell you that. When the question asks about specific details from the passage, it's going to refer you back to specific line numbers. And when that happens, you can go back and you can reread it. But while you don't need to know all of the details, you do have to know the main idea. Most of the questions, even when they're about specific details, they relate back to the main idea. And once you know the main idea, almost all of the questions get a lot easier. So for our purposes, the main idea is the topic of the passage, what it's talking about, and the author's point of view, uh, what he has to say about the topic. And when you combine them, that's the main idea. So I want to show you how this works using one of the passages that was on an actual SAT that was given a few years ago. Here's a passage. I want you to pause the video and take a few minutes to read it. And when you're done, restart the video, and I'm going to show you how to use the main idea to answer all the questions. Okay, now here's how I think of the main idea of this passage. The main idea is that cities are natural systems. The author thinks that cities are good. Other people think that cities are unnatural and that they're bad, and the author thinks that those people are wrong. Now, if what you thought of for the main idea was anything along those lines, then follow along with me as I apply it to answer these questions. If you didn't get that, if your version of the main idea was very different from what I just stated and what's written here on this page, then you might want to listen to my other video about how to find the main idea of a passage, and then come back and restart this video here. Okay, question one. Now, this passage starts off, question 13, I should say. This question starts off with one of those questions that the main idea really doesn't apply. Now, the main idea is going to apply to about 80% of the questions. And about 20% of the questions, it's not going to apply. And when they ask you about what a word means in the context of the paragraph, that's one of those questions where it tends not to apply. But let's look at it. Um, in line one over here, it says, as a scientist, I find that only one vision of the city really gets my hackles up. The notion that a city is somehow unnatural. So the vision is a notion. All right. So vision most nearly means Fantasy, no, that's not a notion. Illusion, no, that's not a notion. Prophecy, nope. Conception is the answer. Apparition, you might not know that word. It's like a ghost or something like that. But conception is the one that means most close to notion. A notion is an idea. Conception is an idea. Okay, question 14. The author would most likely describe the happier state in line 9 as a so let's look at it. I'm going to read the whole sentence. 
Therefore, we should abandon both of our city. There, <laughs> I can't even read. Therefore, we should abandon both our cities and our technologies, and return to an earlier, happier state of existence, one that presumably would include many fewer human beings than inhabit our planet. So, the happier state um, is one that would include many fewer human beings and an abandonment of our cities. Now, we know that the author doesn't agree with that. So, would he describe it as satisfactory? No. A stroke of low luck? No. A complicated arrangement? No. A false supposition? That's going to turn out to be our answer. He thinks it's wrong. That means false. Supposition is an idea, really. A bittersweet memory? No, it's not a memory at all. So this question relates directly back to the main idea, even though it looks like it's asking about a detail. Question 15. According to the author, those who think this way, line 18, view the Industrial Revolution as. Okay, line 18. If you think this way, now what way? Um, and that way is what he's just been talking about. He's still talking about people who don't like cities. If you think this way, you would feel that all of history since the Industrial Revolution represents a wrong turning. So you think it's bad if you think that way. The author doesn't agree with it. So is it an, an important human achievement? No. Um, in instance of technology's double-edged potential? Well, maybe. We'll leave it in. In era when cities became successfully self-sufficient? No. A time when social distinctions became easier to transcend? No. The beginning of a harmful trend in human history. Which one's better, B or E? E is. It's much more in line in keeping with the main idea of the passage, which is that some people think that cities are unnatural and bad, but the author thinks those people are wrong. That's question 15. The author would most, 16, the author would most likely characterize the views of the thinkers referred to in line 28. Let's take a look. What bothers me about this point of view, let's start here, is it implies that human beings, in some deep sense, are not part of nature. Nature, to many environmental thinkers, is what happens when there are no people around. As soon as we show up and start building towns and cities, nature stops and something infinitely less worthwhile starts. So these thinkers here, they're still the people who think cities are bad. The author disagrees with them. So. Naturally, he'd think it's wrong. We want a word that means wrong. Carefully reasoned, no. Thought-provoking, no. Unintelligible, that means they're not understandable, and the author does understand them. He just thinks they're wrong. Inconclusive, no. Erroneous, that means wrong. Question 17. The author compares cities to beaver dams and anthills in order to... Let's scroll this up a little bit so we can see that. Okay, 33 through 36. 33 looks like it starts around here. It seems to me that we should begin our discussion of cities by recognizing that they aren't unnatural any more than beaver dams or anthills are unnatural. So he's saying that cities like beaver dams and, nat and anthills are natural. So in order to show how some ecological systems work? No. Suggest that all three are the products of natural impulses. That's the answer. Scroll it up to here. Cities are natural systems, and they're good. That's the author's main point. So we'll just circle B here. Let me show you why the others are wrong. Assert that they're all detrimental to nature? No. It's the opposite of the author's point of view. 
point out that different species flourish in different environments has nothing to do with the main idea. Call attention to particular obstacles facing cities, no, nope, nothing to do with it. So can you see how that works? Take the main idea, apply it to the questions. It applies directly to four of the first five questions.